The Elephant, known in later life as the Ferdinand for reasons we will get into, was the start of Germany's significant change from more mobile tank destroyers towards heavier designs. Originally never meant to exist, the Ferdinand came about primarily due to the competition between Ferdinand Porsche and Henschel over the Tiger I construction. Now, many of you might be asking, how on earth does a tank destroyer come from a, come from a heavy tank project? This came about because when Porsche was asked to, to produce a tank to compete with Henschel's design, Ferdinand Porsche went off the rails slightly. So in order to cover this, we will have to look at the Tiger One Porsche in order to get a better idea of where on earth we started from. The Ferdinand Tiger, or, or just known as the Porsche Tiger, was an unsuccessful proposal for the Tiger tank design, what would later become the design that we know as the Henschel design, becoming the Tiger I. Most of these tanks would be designed and built in the Nubelwang factory in St. Valentin, Austria. Porsche basically went completely mad when designing the thing. It was highly advanced using an ele uh, using uh, the electro uh, suspension, mounting the turret very towards the front, still utilising the 88mm gun that would see service in the Tiger. The tank was, was ahead of its time. The only problem was, is that it was a little bit too complex for German industry. Subsequently, the Henschel Tiger was chosen for production as the Tiger P was deemed to be just a little bit too off the rails in terms of its complication. Not saying that the Henschel Tiger wasn't complicated, and I will do a video on that because that thing is just as that thing is less complex, but it's still complex. The only problem that Hench, so that, that Ferdinand Porsche had, him being the lead designer, was that the absolute numpty had been so convinced that his design would win that he had already pre-built ninety-one hulls, ninety-one. Now, about uh, uh, several vehicles were sent to do the testing against the Henschel Tiger, but when they all got cancelled, there were just 90 chassis with no turrets sat in the Nibelungwerk factory in Austria. Be because there were so many of these things sat around, that they, were, they didn't know what to do with it. The Germans had no need for the, for the chassis. Ferdinand was a bit disheartened by his loss. So turned around and came up with a design which would still allow his tank to be used. It was decided that the Porsche chassis was to be used for the basis of a new heavy Panzerjäger, which was to be known as the Ferdinand, obviously after Ferdinand Porsche. This design would mount Krupp's new 88mm Pac-43 gun, Panzer Jäger Kanon 43-2. This anti-tank gun, obviously we've discussed previously with the Nashorn, was one of the deadliest anti-tank guns of the war, and is widely considered to be the best of its class. Able to destroy tanks at ridiculously long ranges, its mounting on the Ferdinand was somewhat controversial at the time. The Ferdinand was intended to supplant the roles previously filled up by light like, Panzerjäger, such as the Marder II and the Marder III, in an offensive role. A similar gun to this one was obviously mounted on the Nashorn, which was being built at roughly the same time, but it was then intended that the Nashorn could be used in more defensive dash ambush attacks rather than the Ferdinand's big heavy assault. By the time the design was actually finished, uh, in terms of hard characteristics, the, the, the tank had over 200 millimeters of frontal armor. This, the, the Tiger P was meant to have 200 millimeters anyway, double the thickness of the Henschel Tiger, which on this already temperament, uh, um, temperamental, unreliable chassis was just not going to work. It was powered by two Maybach HL120 TRM petrol engines with 592 horsepower each. Uh, has power to weight ratio is it's it's not it was not very good let's just put it that way uh, it used a longitudinal uh, torsion bar for its suspension which would cause it a multitude of issues throughout its life 
Its operational range was absolutely atrocious, 150 kilometers on the road and 90 kilometers off country. It had a maximum speed of 30 kilometers per hour during trials, though in reality, if you ran the vehicle at this sort of range, you were likely to just break down and be forced to abandon the vehicle. The vehicle weighed 65 tons. It was the heaviest vehicle in German inventory, or the heaviest armored fighting vehicle in German inventory until the King Tiger would see service. With an overall length of 8.14 meters or 26 feet, a width of 3 meters or 11 feet, and a height of 2.9 meters or 9 foot 9 inches. The crew of six was a driver, radio operator, commander, gunner, and two loaders. The tank's weird and unreliable suspension would be the bane of its entire existence. The Ferdinand, however, did set a new benchmark. It became clear that although this suspension design and the chassis in general was not particularly effective, it was, it was shown that heavy chassis, heavy tank chassis could be converted into Panzerjäger chassis. And this would set precedent for what would become known as the Jagdpanzer tank destroyers. Basically, Germany converting any existing chassis that they had into a tank destroyer role. This would obviously lead to the Jagdpanzers, the Jagdpanzer, the Jagdtiger, even the Sturmtiger, if you really want to put it in there. All of which were completely enclosed casements, but most of which were designed with a casemate as an integral of the vehicle's hull armor from the start rather than what had simply been done to the third down design which was simply take the base chassis put a fighting compartment in the back uh, this would lead to the third and obviously being very very tall compared to most of its successors um, the armament as we've talked about was the long barrel 88 millimeter gun the 71 caliber long gun this had been actually intended as a replacement for the 88mm anti-aircraft gun, though the, the FLAC-18 or FLAC-36 would just continue to see service throughout the war. The, the L-71 gun, however, was just absolutely ridiculous. It was, it was unparalleled in terms of its destructive potential up until around the introduction of the 17-pounder, which even then was still not on the same level if we want to be, if we want to be realistic. So in terms of production, 91 Porsche Tiger chassis were converted uh, between March and May 1943. Uh, three Ferdinands, which had been the tra trial versions, were actually converted into recovery versions of a vehicle. And these were completed in the summer of 1943. In 1943, the Germans would commence Operation Barbarossa, not Barbarossa, sorry, Citadel. What the earth am I talking about? The Battle of Kursk. Let's say. At the Battle of the Battle of Kursk had been delayed several times uh, for a multitude of reasons, uh, so ranging from the Allied invasion of Sicily through to the fact that Hitler wanted his new heavier vehicles. He wanted more Tigers and Panthers, and this actually gave the Ferdinand a little bit of a chance because the vehicles were able to be completed in time for the summer offensive, Battle of Kursk would be its first engagement. 89 would be committed to the battlefield, the largest deployment of the vehicle throughout its history. The Ferdinand during Operation, during Operation Citadel was absolutely lethal. Its, its gun was capable of knocking out T-34s from over three kilometers, you know, a role which you can find fantastic, excellent sights, and was able to resist all return fire. The only issue really with the tank was that it was a mechanical nightmare. Any damage to the tracks or suspension negated the protection of the armour as crews were forced to dismount to attempt repairs. The immense weight of the Ferdinand made the towing difficult. The standard armed recovery vehicle in the German army at the time was the Bergpanzer IV, which was a Panzer IV chassis converted to the role. It could pull the Panzer IV without assistance and with a little bit of help could, uh, could tow a Tiger I, 
but required five of them to to pull a single Ferdinand from the field. Uh, in addition to the obviously mechanical failings, the Ferdinand was hampered by flaws such as lack of peripheral vision blocks or a machine gun as a secondary defensive armament, a problem which would later be resolved. Uh, reports that coming from the front line would report Soviet infantry recognizing this flaw and running at the Ferdinands whenever infantry wasn't available to protect them. Molotov cocktails normally being the result of losses. Losses of the Soviet infantry are disputed in our fraction reports, uh, while Hans Guderian himself complained that the elephant, much to other felt designs, suffered from a lack of close range protection against infantry assaults. 1943 would really start to see the German infantry struggling to contain the number of Soviet infantry. In the initial stages of, of the Battle of Kursk, the Germans could quite easily recover their Ferdinands and get them repaired and back into duty. With the tide turning, however, and back on the defensive, there were fewer vehicles to spare. Functional Ferdinands with minor damage to their tracks and suspensions had little hope of recovery, and crews were usually forced to destroy the vehicles uh, and then abandon them. And many of them would be lost in the aftermath of Kursk. The units were destroyed at company level, some were sometimes subdivided into platoons with infantry and tanks to accommodate uh, their flanks. On the attack, this Jagdpanzer was a first strike vehicle one defence. They often comprise a mobile reserve used to blunt enemy armoured assaults. Post Kursk, it was realised what had gone wrong, that things were analysed and the tanks were eventually modified significantly. The first thing that they did was add an MG34. For the record, of the 50 surviving vehicles that were that were left by the 2nd of January 1944, when they returned to the factory in Austria, 48 would receive upgrades. So obviously, the first upgrade is they have a ball mounted MG34 put in the hull. Second is a new commander's cupola, modified from the standard Stug 3 cupola for improved vision. Three, uh, redesigned armoured engine grates for better bullet and shrapnel protection, and also to prevent Molotov cocktails from being a routine issue. And the fourth was the application of Zimra anti-magnetic mine paste. So, the, and subsequently, the tanks would be renamed from Ferdinand uh, to the Elephant, and uh, to distinguish the difference between those with the machine gun, without the machine gun, effectively. Um, all the updated Ferdinands were ready by February 1944, which if you consider they turned up in January and they had 48 vehicles to upgrade, the turnaround was quite, was quite quick. Um, they were all issued to the first company of uh, the 653rd Heavy Panzer Battalion, also known as, or in German, that's pronounced Schwerpanzerjäger Panzer Jäger Abteilung 653, which was immediately deployed to Italy in response to the Allied landings at Anzio. The remaining 37 vehicles were completed in April and issued to the second and third companies of Stelpanzieg Abteilung uh, 653 and sent by train to the Tonopol battles in Ukraine. So, just for the record, the first 11 completed Ferdinands were sent to the first company of the 653 uh, and then were deployed to Italy. The remaining 37 vehicles were deployed to the second and third company of the same a battalion and sent to Ukraine. At this point in the war, this is not uncommon. Uh, often German divisions would find that they were fighting on all three fronts. They had different battalions and companies being sent all over the place. On the 1st of May 1944, a German Army High Command, also as the OKW, issued an order to formally change the Panzerjäger's name from Ferdinand to Elephant. This order forbade future use of Ferdinand and even direct units in the field to edit their records. This is contrary to popular belief that name change was linked to the January April mechanical update to the Ferdinand Panzerjäger. The name was changed, was purely administrative in nature. The three Bogpanzer armored recovery were converted, uh, the three more Bogpanzer armored recovery vehicles were converted and issued to the second and third companies in the summer of 1944 to help with recovery efforts. Um, Although modifications improved the vehicles, some problems could never fully be fixed. 
In 1944, the Ferdinand Elephant served on the Italian front but were rather ineffective because the upgrade had made them nearly 70 tons and did not allow them to use most Italian roads and bridges. Also, the hilly terrain of Italy made breakdowns a complete norm. At Kursk, most losses were not as a result from combat but a result of mechanical breakdowns and lack of spare parts, compelling their crews to destroy and abandon them. One company of elephants saw combat against the Soviets in 1945 during the Vistula Oda Offensive in Poland. The last surviving vehicles were in combat at Zossen during the Battle of Berlin, where they were sacrificed ultimately to try and hold the line. In conclusion, there has been much said about the elephant um, Ferdinand. It has the most successful uh, kill loss ratio of any tank destroyer or any armored vehicle of the war for that matter um it's actual it's, its average claim ratio is approximately 10 to 1. uh during the battle of kursk uh the panzer jaeger of tailung 653 claimed to have knocked out 320 enemy tanks for the loss of only 13 ferdinand it's an impressive average the issue was due to the superior firepower and the protection which gave it an enormous advantage when used in head-on combat or static defensive roles. Um, it is, however, to be noted that claim tank kills are well proven to invariably greater excess actual kills and different organizations. Da, 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 da. Basically, basically uh, numbers can be ranked up out of nowhere. It's a bit like fighter pilots. Uh, they normally massively over-exaggerate how many kills they've got. Ultimately, the vehicle's form ability and mechanical reliability greatly diminish its operational capability. Uh, they were all superseded by, both types of vehicle would be superseded by the Jagdpanzer, um, and then ultimately by Jagdpanzers and the Arctiga in the long run. The Jagdpanzers would address the reliability issues and, and all everything else that had been suffered from the Elephant. In total, if you look at heavy Panzerjägers of the German army, the Elephant has probably the most, as the honour of being the first, and probably one of the most successful test beds for future designs. You know, the success of the Jagdpanzers and the Jagdpanthers and obviously Jagdtigers and their reli any reliable su reliability successes that they had largely comes from the Ferdinand and the testing that was done on the Ferdinand in combat scenarios. In terms of survivors, there are only two survivors left. One Ferdinand was captured by the Soviets at, court, at Kursk and was sent to testing in Kubinka. Uh, it was it's now displayed at the Kubinka Tank Museum outside Moscow. Its gun mantle was painted red. Its chassis number is unknown. Uh, there are multiple conflicting reports on the chassis number. Uh, an elephant numbered 102 of Chapin Diego of Tailung 653 was captured at Anzio by the Americans and is now part of the United States Warning and Training Support Facility at Fort Lee um, in Virginia. The example at Fort Lee was restored to display condition in 2008. Um, and was temporarily loaned to the Tank Museum at Bovington between April 2017 and January 2019, later returning to the States. This really is a bit of an unfortunate scenario when you look, because the thing about it is, and I will do a video about why I feel the elephant has a massively unjust reputation. When you look at the elephant, you look at the reputation the vehicle has, everyone turns it around and everyone just goes, ah, Elephant, Ferdinand, unreliable, broke down all the time, da 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 da. No one really talks about the fact that it was completely deployed improperly for a vehicle of its size. It was a test bed designed to all intents and purposes. It only existed because Ferdinand Porsche's ego was so large that he pre built nearly a hundred vehicles for a project that he then lost out on. And the fact that the Germans then built these things and they did with them and then successfully deployed them is completely mind-boggling. Um, anyway, regardless of which, um, thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, it's a bit of a long one because of my ranting and rambling. Uh, thank you very much for all the support on the previous video. 
Uh, if you would like to like and subscribe to the channel, and you could uh, comment comment on whatever tanks you'd like to see uh, talk about. I love talking about these things. They're fantastic vehicles. Um, hoping to get a new microphone set up so that we can, you know, you can hear me better. And yeah, so thank you very much, and I'll speak to you guys next time.